in America. Only in America. Only in America. Only in America. This week, the path forward for those affected by America's archaic immigration system and what you can do to help make changes for immigrants and their families in our communities. We need to start building bridges between communities and uh, new arrivals. We need to have conversation, honest conversation between one another, learn about one another, see how we can function together to benefit our our communities that, that we live in. From the National Immigration Forum, I'm Ali Nirani and this is Only in America. Last week, we looked back on the Biden administration's progress in its first year, particularly unwinding the previous administration's restrictive changes to our immigration system and building something better. This week, we're going to take a forward-facing approach to the challenges of our country and the immigration system as a whole. First of all, if you've been keeping up with our morning newsletter and social media channels, you've seen how the pandemic is revealing some serious labor shortages. Many economists are speaking out about a major factor contributing to those shortages, a disappearing immigrant workforce, both documented and undocumented. Some economists are estimating that nearly 2 million immigrant workers are missing from the United States economy. So what's a way to help with this? Here's Krish Omara Vignaraja, president and CEO of Lutheran Immigrant and Refugee Services. One is certainly sort of integration um, and economic empowerment. Uh, we have certainly seen it even with our Northern Virginia office, we created a second site and of the 14 staff, uh, 13 are, are Afghan, the majority are people who recently arrived. And I only give this anecdotal example because I think it speaks volumes to the nature of the intent of our clients to give back as quickly as they can. And I think that it is such an opportunity for us right now because we all know whether it is our local coffee shop or you know some other venue where it's been closed because of a lack of staff and so this to me is a win-win opportunity where regularly the the first question or the second question we get is when can we start working and so i think really investing in robust economic empowerment uh, work, making sure that we're working with employers. There are a lot of private partners that stepped up this year, but how do we make sure that we are clear that this is not just charity, right? This is about what is in businesses' economic interests, in America's economic interests. Taif Jaini with Refugee Council USA agrees, adding that the U.S. should look at complementary pathways similar to other countries. I'll speak as a as a refugee for a bit, uh, also as a former international student. That's how I came to the U.S. In, in the first place. But we need our system at the end of the day. We can talk about reforming it for days. It's an outdated system. And it really, it's in desperate, desperate need to some, to some rebuilding and some modernization. And one way to do that, that other countries are doing it, is by implementing these complementary pathways to our refugee resettlement uh, processes, including, for example, providing educational pathways for, for refugee students and, and others in need to come to the U.S., not only to seek their education, but to also contribute back. Like, that's the, that's the other beauty of our complementary pathways is, is, is whether it's work or whether it's education, the return of that investment to our communities is enormous. Refugee students, immigrant students, and workers contribute so much to our cultural diversity, to uh, uh, strengthening our educational kind of institutions uh, nationwide and, and much more. Investing in pathways to citizenship would also include upgrades in technology and staffing. Here's Lacey Bremel from the International Refugee Assistance Project on those needs. The operational and resource commitment behind all of these um, pathways. I think that's definitely a dream and vision for what the program could be and what the U.S. can really become more of a welcoming nation and be resilient for the future to address crises that will emerge um, is to have sufficient and plenty of resources, including staff, including, you know, expanding out the use of video technology. We know technology investments take time and money, and, and that's you know, one example of the ways that um, really commitment to scaling up operational functionality is just absolutely critical. 
we need to be aggressive. We need to be innovative in terms of ramping up progress. Um, some of that is uh, the implementation of, of hiring additional staff. Um, you know, now that we are a year in, uh, I think, you know, I, I hate to say that there are no excuses, but this is where um, a, a real commitment to the program means that we need to see um, more staffing, more circuit rides, uh, more use of remote interviews. Obviously, even this is happening virtually, right? So how do we use the technology that we are all using in our day-to-day -day lives in terms of expanding the pipeline that we see overseas? Another issue to consider, the United States' approach to immigration enforcement and border militarization in the face of a mounting climate migration crisis. Well, recently, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services released a report on ways to act on solutions to this. We know that in the 21st century, this is going to be the prime driver for migration. And given that this is not some future dynamic that we have decades and decades to prepare for, I think that the report is a building block, but it's obviously so far from where we need to be. Um, LIRS actually published um, its own recommendations in terms of the, how the Biden administration could act swiftly and boldly um, towards you know, concrete, actionable, time-bound solutions. And I think that this needs to be an urgent priority. Um, climate change is contributing to migration in a way that we already see it. Um, it's an opportunity for America to lead because no country in the world has created a legal pathway uh, for um, climate-induced uh, migrants to seek relief. And so I think there's some real opportunities there. There are so many issues that we're facing, and the displacement crisis has been one that's been growing over the past, you know, 10 plus years. So I think that seeing the White House implement high level leadership was something that would be really, really helpful um, to making sure that all these things happen um, on resettlement, working with climate displaced populations and making sure that asylum seekers are able to safely present their claims and, and be, you know, have safety here in the United States. The safety of all immigrants in the U.S. should be everyone's number one priority. But we know that it's been a tough few years for many immigrant communities dealing with fear-mongering, xenophobia, and hate. So how can we foster more acceptance for immigrants in our communities? We need to start building bridges between communities and uh, new arrivals, immigrants, asylum seekers, Everyone who's trying to seek a new opportunity, we need to have conversation, honest conversation between one another, learn about one another, see how we can function together to uh, benefit our, our communities that, that we live in, learn from one another how just to function uh, as a society and how to have to move forward. You know, we went backward a whole lot over the past few years. You know, when, when I was back home in, in Iraq, a lot of the times, you know, I was looking at, at America through the lens of my TV. And I'm like, my goodness, I wish I'm there one day and just to experience what that life is like. And when I came here, so many people embraced me, gave me the opportunities, taught me so much about, uh, you know, different cultures, different communities, people from all over the world that came and made, made America their new home. I mean, isn't that what what we aspire to in our American dream. And that's what I loved. I love that. I love the opportunities that those who extended uh, the, the arm of support to me, they didn't ask for anything. They didn't ask for any political affiliation. They just said, Tyth, you're here. How can we help? And now I'm in a position to be like, all right, I'm an American right now. Well, what can I do? How can I give back? And, and, and so those conversations are, are gonna be crucial, and especially if we're talking about uh, the, the new arrivals, uh, they're gonna need so much support. You know, someone might kind of point me out as an immigrant. The truth is we are a nation of immigrants, right? Unless you are uh, part of the indigenous community or you were forced um, to come to the US, you know, due to slavery, someone in your lineage made a decision to come to the US and I think that really us leaning into this messaging of they are us and we are them um, requires that people who look, I mean, sometimes people wonder where's the O'Mara part come from in my name? Well, that's my husband, Colin Patrick O'Mara, who has a nice Irish Catholic name. So his immigrant story is a little bit more dated than mine, right? But his ancestors came from Ireland after the potato famine. And each of us connecting to that is gonna be how we 
provide a little bit more of this empathy because I think that the othering that's where where this happening right now is is what allows for people to complain about chain migration as their in-laws are coming to the country, right? That is what we need to kind of fight against. And then the second point is we need to be armed when we go into these conversations, knowing that the arguments that may resonate with some of us may not resonate with our target audience, right? We got to get out of this echo chamber. So finally, how do you put these ideas into action? Here's Lacey, Taif, and Krish on tangible ways to do something. And now is absolutely the moment to be calling your member of Congress and expressing your care and interest on this issue. And even, you know, you can write it, you can write an op-ed or a letter to the editor in your local paper. You can, you know, be vocal on social media. There are so many ways for you to share um, that the United States needs to commit to humanitarian pathways for Afghans and building up all those other systems that we were talking about earlier to make sure people from all over the world who are in need of protection and support and resettlement can receive that. Contact your member of Congress, push more push for the Afghan Adjustment Act. We need the act to pass so we can allow these uh, folks the opportunity to, to just have that ease of mind and just start settling down. Again, like just coming to the United States is is it, it, not it. That's not the end of the journey. For most of these people, it's, it's just the beginning, and especially if you're on humanitarian parole and you're even uncertain about your future, you know, it, it puts so much more tension and burden on these families. So that the, the Afghan Adjustment Act is going to be absolutely critical in, in, in providing that. Let's remember that how we got to 125,000 as the presidential determination was a result of advocates, um, so many on this, you know, in this conversation today, being leaders, right? So many in the audience recognizing that sometimes we've got to force um, even people who are well-intentioned to do the right thing. And I think that just keeping that in mind and realizing that we do have the power uh, to change policy, um, I think is incredibly useful and empowering. Krish Omara Vignaraja is president and CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services. Taif Jaini is director of policy and practice at Refugee Council USA. And Lacey Brummel is a policy analyst at the International Refugee Assistance Project. We'd like to thank them for being a part of our Facebook Live conversation on what's next for refugee resettlement. If you like what you heard here, please be sure to check out the full conversation on our Facebook page. That conversation is titled, one year anniversary of Joe Biden's presidency. What's next for a refugee resettlement? Only in America is produced and edited by Katie Lutz, Joanna Taylor, and Becca Wall. Our artwork and graphics are designed by Carla Leha. I'm Ali Nirani, and I will talk to you next week. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and strengthening international peace and security and from Humanity United. When humanity is united, we can bring a powerful force for human dignity.